Welcome to this first lecture on neural networks and deep learning. Part of the objective of this set of lectures that come out of this is to sort of introduce the concepts and ideas behind what modern neural networks do and how they can be applied to engineering and physical science type systems. So this is chapter six out of the book on data-driven science and engineering. Everything can be found here at databookuw.com, including uh, a full set of uh, lecture notes, as well as code base, both in MATLAB and Python for your use that does all the stuff I will show you in the set of lectures for this chapter and all of the lectures. Okay, so let's start off by starting to think about neural network architectures. And this is sort of a very generic picture of what a neural architecture looks like. What you're really trying to think about in a neural network is mapping an input layer, let's call it X, to an output layer why? Now, if you go back to chapter four of the book on regression, this is exactly what a regression framework looks like. Map an input to a target through some model F with some parameters beta. So if you go back and look at those lectures, this is simply a regression. And this regression is just taking me from X to Y, where my model now is some kind of activation functions, which we'll talk about in these sets of lectures, between each layer, and these are called hidden units in the middle. Okay, so for instance, here you have two hidden layers, and the weights I'm trying to determine, or in other words, the parameters beta in the regression that I talked about in the regression chapter, are the weights of these network connections. In other words, what's the value of the weight here connecting this node to this node? And in fact, I need to find all of those weights. In fact, what I need to do is optimize to find the best value of those weights matching a set of data that ma maps me from some input to some target Y, X to Y. So there is nothing different here fundamentally than just simple regression. It's just that now my weights, there's a lot of them. In fact, it's a very high dimensional optimization problem because I have to find all of these weights, okay? More than that, my model itself is very different now. My model is a set of layers. In fact, I can impose all kinds of network architectures that will, in fact, constrain the kind of solutions that I might have out of this system. So part of the set of lectures that are going to come out of this chapter are ways to start thinking about this. And just as in regression, when you start thinking about your objective function and the kind of error metrics you want to use and the kind of norms you want to measure your error with, it will matter a great deal here as well what your objective function ultimately starts to look like. So anyway, this is just a generic conception. You can have all-to-all -all connections, you have sparse connections, doesn't have to be all-to-all. -all. You can have linear functions from one level to the other. You can have nonlinear functions from one, le one level to the other. The generic thing might be to have nonlinear connections from each layer to each other, and then at the output maybe a linear connection layer, but some of these things will be discussed uh, later in this chapter. So the optimization procedure looks something like this. What I'd really like to do is go from the input to the output. So the generic nature of the optimization is gonna look a lot like a nested set of functions, compositional in other, in other words, in nature. So if I go from the input layer to the first hidden unit, that's this function F1. So the matrix A1 tells me all the weights that were used to map me from my original input variable X to my hidden variable unit. But then this now is used to go to F2 to take me through weights A2 to the next level and to the next level. So what this gives you is architecture, which is a nested set of functions or a composition structure where the weights are embedded in each layer of this model. And my objective here is to, in fact, optimize over all the weights, subject to some regularization. There it is, lambda g of a. So I can impose some kind of regularization, for instance, on the weights. Now, 
What's important, again, making connection to the regression. In the regression chapter, we always talked about, I am trying to optimize some function, some objective, with some regularization. And this regularization will play a really important role in the kind of solution structures that you get out. So this is a generic feature of all regression problems, but this has this very interesting architecture of having a compositional nature. And by the way, the compositional nature of this will allow us to do the optimization of this using a combination generically of gradient descent with what's called the backpropagation algorithm. And the backpropagation algorithm is simply chain rule on this compositional structure. And that is going to be the third lecture of this. And the, the, the gradient descent at scale, which is we're going to talk about stochastic gradient descent, will be the fourth lecture in this chapter. But for now, this is sort of the generic architecture that we want to consider. We're going to have to do a very high dimensional optimization problem of a compositional nature with some regularization. Now, I want to simplify this initially because this here has the objective with regularization. This is the, you know, the generic form of the problem. What I'd really like to do is consider a simpler version of this problem to start getting some understanding of how neural networks actually work. So let's start off with something that is about as simple as possible. I have an input layer X, and in this case, it's going to be an image. In fact, the images I'm going to do is very much like what we did in chapter five on clustering and classification. The images of dogs and cats, okay? So my input layer will be in pixel space, the representation of one of those dogs or cats. And what I'm going to map this to is I'm not even going to have any hidden layers in the middle. I'm just going to map it right to my output layer, which is a one node output. And what I wanted to do is I want to call this, this is sort of what's called early on was called the perceptron, which is I'm mapping this to an output where I want this output to be plus one or minus one. So plus one if it's a dog, minus one if it's a cat. So I'm going to give a bunch of training data of dogs and cats with their labels, which are ones and plus, plus ones and minus ones. And what I want to do is train these weights in here so that I can most effectively map, effectively map that input to an output and make a classification decision. So every image is going to be basically projected onto that output, and I'm going to make a decision whether it's a dog or a cat. So generically, you would have nonlinear activation functions. So in other words, the map from here to here and this integration that occurs at that output would have some nonlinear function there. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of these nonlinear activation functions in the next lecture. But right now, let's just assume I just have a linear map from here to there. So another way to think about this is just this is AX equal to B. I'm going to take the, the matrix, say, multiply by x to produce y, okay? So that is the way I'm going to construct the simplest neural network in some sense with a linear layer, so no nonlinear activation functions, mapping me from pixel space to a label, which is plus 1, minus 1. So here it is. I just formulated my first neural net then as a very simple linear regression. Here it is, ax equals to b, or ax equals to y. x is, in fact, my input image. y is my label. My model is a linear map, a. And so I have to find all the parameters in that matrix a. So it's just ax equal to b. That's the structure. So let's talk about it expanded out. So the way this is going to work is I have this matrix a, which is actually a row vector. Right? I made a very simple model here. So the row vector is just the weights a1, a2, all the way through a of n. These are the coefficients of my matrix A, which takes me from this high dimensional space to one value. Okay? If I had made this go to a uh, you know, higher dimensional output, like I could have said the cat is a 1, 0, and a 0, 1, then this would be a matrix with two rows and n columns. Okay? But for right now, I made the simplest thing possible. Okay, so my goal is to determine these weights. How should I weight each of these different pixels to map me to an output, which is a label, whether it's a dog or a cat? 
Now, what I'm going to put in here is my training data, X1 through X of P. These are all my cat dog pictures. So each column is a dog or a cat picture. And Y is its label, plus one or minus one. This is about as simple as it gets in the machine learning architecture. Take about its images with labels, ones and minus ones, just linear regress. And so the linear regression just turns out to be this. Okay, so the question is, how well does this work? But by the way, there's another interesting observation here. When we've done systems like this previously, AX equal to B, in fact, we covered this in section four in regression. When we do over or underdetermined systems, AX equal to B, we get to specify some regularization. And that regularization makes a big difference in what the solution would look like. And here we're trying to find this A, and depending upon the kind of regularization I impose on this AX equal to B, I'll get very different answers. Okay? So that's gonna be the thing we're gonna do is just program this first very simple operation just to get a feel for what neural networks do or what, uh, the simplest neural network architecture which collapses to a linear regression. What does that look like? And the second chapter, uh, second section of this chapter, we'll modify this and allow this to be nonlinear activation functions and even do multiple layers. But for right now, this is what we have is a very simple model with the hope that we can build some intuition about how things work and how machine learning is actually doing some processing to make a map from a picture to a label. And this is the very simplest architecture possible. So. There's one solution, by the way. I'm trying to determine A. Just take the suit of inverse on the right-hand side of each of these. So X, X pseudo inverse is the identity, and Y, X pseudo inverse. This gives me a solution for A. This is the least square solution, and we're gonna look at what that least square solution gives us in a moment, okay? But there are other ways to solve this. We could impose, in fact, some regularization, like a little bit of L1 penalization, or other ways to solve the x equal to b, and you'll find that we get very different solutions in that case. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some code, and when we look at the code, I thought we'll look at what the output for that code looks like for us. So here's the code. It's a very simple model, as I'm showing you. So, so first of all, let's start here. So what I want to do is take the data of cat and dog data, and again, this is the cat and dog data in the wavelet domain. This is something we played around with extensively both in chapter four and chapter five. And so I can take this data, I can load in cat data, I can load in dog data, and then CD is the cat dog data combined, which is dog wave, cat wave. So now I've got all the data combined. Cats and dogs, 80 cats, 80 dogs. And so what I'm gonna do now is from that, is I'm going to make a test set and a training set. So my training set is the first 60 dogs, first 60 cats. The test set is the 61st to 80th dog, 61st to 80th cat. That's it. So normally what you do is you'd randomly select, but for right now, just to sort of this very simple demonstration, I'm just going to take the first 60 dogs, train it, first 60 cats, train it, and then see how well do I label the remaining dogs and cats. Okay, so I'm gonna get some scores from that, just with this very simple neural network architecture, which is a linear regression. So as I just showed you, one way to do this is with the pseudo inverse. So all I'm gonna do is take my label, which is the output Y, times the pseudo inverse of the training data, which was the matrix X. That's it. I actually wrote down that solution, or had it here on the board, which was all the values of A was Y, X pseudo inverse. There it is. So I just determined A from the training data, which was the first 60 dogs, first 60 cats. Okay? So my test labels, all I care about is the sign of those, actually. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go take this model A, since now I've trained it, and I'm going to go hit the test set with it, and see, did it come out to plus one or minus one? And of course it's not to come out to exactly plus one or minus one. All I care about though, is it bigger than zero or less than zero? If it's bigger than zero, I'm gonna call it a one. 
If it's less than zero, call it a minus one. So I'm going to take the sign of what I get out of this when I hit the test data. So the test labels are what my model was trained to produce, and I'm going to ask how well did it do in labeling the withhold data that I had as the test set. Okay? So this is one way to do it, is through the pseudo-inverse. I'm going to show you one other way to do this, which is it's ax equal to b. So instead of training it with a least square regression, I'm instead going to do a lasso regression. Remember, this is ax equal to b, and it's a penalization of the L1 norm. So it's going to promote sparsity. So I'm going to put the training data in there, the label data in there, and I'm going to promote sparsity at a certain level. Okay, So I can toggle how much sparsity penalty I want. So I put it at 0.1. If you make it higher, it's going to make it less, more sparse. If you make it very low, if lambda is zero, then it's going to be just an L2. It's going to be no sparsity promotion whatsoever. So I'm giving you another solution to this x equal to b problem. Pseudo inverse, lasso. That's it. So what we're going to do is see what those models look like and what the features are it's keying in on to make these decisions. Okay? And it's also going to show the performance. All right, so let's run this. And you're going to see what happens here. So, first, I'm going to show you the matrix A looks like. I'll get to this one here in a minute. Here is the matrix A for those two cases. So first of all, this is the matrix A when you apply the pseudo-inverse. So first of all, I want you to see this. Look at the structure that's there in, this, in these pixels. In fact, if you look back at chapter five, when we talk about uh, uh, the cat-dog data set and looking at clustering classification, these, this pixel structure looks a lot like the dominant PCA components that you would have from the data. Now this makes sense because in fact you're doing a linear regression and PCA is in fact looking at a linear correlation of the covariance matrix, okay? So this, or, okay, so that, that's what it's doing. And so you see that structure pop out here. You can see the eyes here, the nose. Then you see these characteristics, air shapes, which are very prominent in the first two principal components if you take cat-dog data and do the SVD, okay? So that's what you get if you do the pseudo-inverse, and at least it makes sense in that context. Now what's interesting over here, this is the lasso solution. So what it's trying to do is say, of all these network weights, in other words, if I'm looking at this pixel space, I'm going to try to make the weights mostly zero, because you're promoting the L1 norm as a penalty, which promotes sparsity, and looks what it gives you. Here, what it's doing is it turns almost everything off to zero except near the eyes, a little bit here in the structure of the ears, and so forth. So it's really informative about what are the features it's looking at in these images to make a classification decision about dogs and about cats. And so both of you give, give two very different solutions, but you can see they have interpretability. Both of these features that you're getting out of with this linear regression have structure that is at least intuitive and easy to understand in the context of this problem. Now let me show you some performance metrics. Here they are. For these two different solution types, what I'm showing you here on the top is for the first 20, it's supposed to be all dogs and then cats. And what, so what you're seeing here, I got 15 right and I got five wrong. Okay, so I have about a 75% accuracy with the dogs, but for the cats, I got three out of 20 wrong. That is using the pseudo-inverse, and what you're seeing here, this is the loadings or coefficients of the matrix A. Okay, they're all non-zero, and they're spread out across here. There's 1024 of them, okay, because the image was 64 by 64. And so you see, there's, they're all non-zero. It weights all the pixels to make a decision about whether it's a cat or dog, right? So the whole picture, you scan across. It says, let me give a weight to each one. 
and making a decision about cats, dogs. Here, this is the lasso result. Now the lasso result, you actually got quite a few dogs wrong, many more, but only two cats. And of course, this is a random draw, and it's a small data set, so you shouldn't overreact or even read too much into what these results are meaning. You know, we'd want a lot more data than this, but it's just, it, it's just sort of a, an exemplar of what you might get out of this thing. So here you go, this is the results though. So it gets a lot of dogs wrong, two cats wrong, okay? And here is what the loadings look like for the matrix A. Almost everything is zero except for a few places, and those few places are the eyes, the ears. So in this solution strategy with this regularization of L1, what it's actually going after is it's looking for features that you and I both identify as important, which is ears, eyes, nose. Those things matter in making a classification decision, and this thing here says, let's ignore all the pixels aside from the ones associated with that to make the decision about whether this is a cat or a dog. So it's a very interpretable, easy to understand kind of regression, and starting to help you understand what a neural network is trying to do. It's trying to create a map from an input to an output with a model, and this model being a neural network structure where you have to find all the weights, okay? It's a regression problem. It's as simple as that. It's just that the regression problem has a certain form, and that form can get you things like this. All right, so that is our first example of a neural network architecture. And I think I want to come back here real quick and just emphasize that, again, this, is, this architecture, although I did as simple as possible, really starts to highlight a lot of the features we want to look at later on, which is you're going to go from an input, you're going to get to an output. Typically, there's going to be nonlinear weights. It's going to have a functional form. And in particular, for neural nets, the important thing that's going to happen is, is there's a few things that are going to happen that are important for neural nets. One, this optimization problem, where we're going to see over and over again, is going to have a very specific form. In other words, that specific form is of a composition. Each layer maps to the next. The next layer composes to the next layer. So this compositional form is absolutely critical and canonical for neural network architectures. The regularization, as I just showed you, plays an incredibly important role in the kind of results you get out. So you're gonna have composition, regularization, and your job is to find all of these weights across the network and find an optimization strategy to do it. The optimization strategy is gonna be a gradient descent, but at scale, we're gonna use stochastic gradient descent. And because it's compositional, this backpropagation algorithm we'll talk about in the third lecture is going to come into play, which is going to allow us to basically do a chain rule across this compositional structure, which is exactly the key. Those are the two keys to going to scale, the stochastic gradient descent and the backpropagation or the way to do um, a chain rule across a compositional structure. So those will play key roles and actually developing neural network architectures. So this has been an introduction. It sets up the stage that two things I want you to walk away with. One, neural nets are nothing more than just a regression problem. That's it. There's an input, there's an output. Your model is the neural net and has lots of weights, which are the parameters that you gotta find. Number two, we're gonna have to do optimization at very large scale. There's two features there that matter a lot for us, stochastic gradient descent, backpropagation. Those are going to be the key things that we're going to key on in the rest of this chapter. But other than that, there is nothing more really to neural networks than those kind of important uh, pieces that are there. And a lot of neural networks have design properties, but these basic features are still part of the underlying structure that you have to consider in a, in a broad sense. Again, everything can be found here at the website for the book, databookuw.com. All the notes are here. There's a PDF link you can download. All the notes. Code base is all available in both Python, MATLAB, and lots more lectures uh, uh, for the book and also this section on uh, neural networks.